Ladies and gentlemen, attention please. Coming close where everyone can see. Oh, I got a tale to tell and it isn't gonna cost a dime. And if you believe that, we're gonna get along just fine. Snake oil. First you make people believe they have a problem, then you sell them the solution. That's how advertising works. Every snake oil salesman knows that. And thus is the theme to tonight's story, another fantastic one from Dr. Creepin's Vault. Well, my dear friends, we've made it to another Friday night, so I just want you to sit back and relax with your favourite drink, and listen. For the record, I'm not telling this story to clear my name. I know a lot of people think I'm hiding something, or that I'm nuttier than a can of almonds, and I could change all that if I just coughed up the evidence they want. <laughs> Believe me, I was tempted in the beginning just to do that. Sorry, you're now out of luck. I destroyed the video file, you understand. That video file, the evidence that every reporter and voyeur and federal agent out there claims I still have. The evidence that would explain what happened with Dr. Mark's final seminar. I had to destroy the video. I even obliterated my hard drive to be sure. I hope to God it was the only copy. And besides, I'm better at telling my story through my writing than speaking to a reporter. I'm a transcriber by trade. Well, my name is irrelevant. Only my job title matters. I get hired to write down the dialogue from live shows and official phone calls, all for record keeping and the hearing impaired, well, and so on. I'm pretty good at my job, taking down words almost as quickly as I hear them. And I'm also on the verge of obsolescence, since I have computer programs nearly good enough to do my job. <sighs> A few more years, and my position is history. That used to depress me, but not so much now. I had the glorious task of transcribing the showing of Dr. Mark Weston's final seminar, his big going-away session, the kind of hype-driven event reserved for singers and revivalists. Usually, when I transcribe a show, I'm physically at the production. Mark had insisted that only the truest of fans could be present in the convention hall, even amongst the production staff. And his definition of true fan was someone who'd read his previous three self-help books cover to cover. He wasn't kidding, either. He was so serious about this point that to get a ticket you had to complete an online survey, answering 30 random questions that demonstrated your knowledge of each book. If you pass a survey, you had a chance at a ticket. Dr. Mark also prohibited any cell phones or cameras in the auditorium, as well as any live feeds. <laughs> like I said, only true fans could be a part of this. But one of the producers, surely a true fan of Dr. Mark, but a truer fan of making money, decided to live stream the seminar to my home laptop so I could do my job. I signed the usual confidentiality agreement and went to work. So, what you're about to read is based on my written transcriptions. It won't be as good as the video file, but it's the best you're going to get. Also keeping a few details vague or hidden, so as to prevent you from retracing my steps or learning something dangerous. This is a cliff that we're racing towards, you and I. And while I'll do my part to put on the brakes at the right time, you'll have to do your part as well. Hell, I keep thinking I shouldn't even do this much, that I should burn all my records and let the knowledge die with me. But I can't in good conscience stay quiet, because it's not safe for you to know what happened, but it's worse if you don't. If you don't know which city the seminar took place in, or which convention centre held the event, then you haven't been watching the news at all. All that is public knowledge. The convention centre was the one Dr. Mark had used before, capable of accommodating an audience of 10,000. Most of the time, Dr. Mark could get every seat filled in the place. This time, 
official numbers, but Dr. Mark's final seminar audience, well, the total was half that. It was unusual that he would restrict the event size so much, but that didn't tip off anyone at the time. After all, it was for true fans only. He also rented the place for a single one-day event, with nothing else planned. Now, that may not seem important, but since Dr. Mark made his living on improving the lives of his readers, he usually made himself available to clients and fans on a more personal basis by doing workshops and special sessions for those folks willing to pay his fees, typically scheduled before and after his public performances. This time, it was just that one final seminar. And it was certainly starting to feel like his final one. By the time the live feed began, the audience was already seated expectantly, a few latecomers racing to get their chairs before the lights dimmed. The crowd was a genuine slice of Americana, a melting pot of male and female, light and dark, youth and age. Lots of excited, beaming faces awaited Dr. Mark's final pearls of wisdom. Looking at the audience, I couldn't help but feel how perfect the scene appeared, as if Dr. Mark had deliberately summoned a crowd you could proudly feature in your company's advertising to show how egalitarian and global your company had become. Now, I don't know the demographic makeup of Dr. Mark's fanbase, but I have a hard time believing you could bring together an audience this perfectly diverse through random selection. What were the odds? A few minutes into my feed... The show's start time arrived. The ceiling lights dimmed, the crowd's murmurs hushed, and the spotlights kicked on, flooding the stage before us in brilliant white. Even through the live stream, I could feel the energy in the air, the pulsating desire of the people to give it up for the man who had, maybe, kinda, sorta, almost changed their lives for the better. They knew this was going to be special, a once-in-a-lifetime moment, validation for all their loyalty and commitment to Dr. Mark's philosophy. I have to admit that, going into this job, I had no idea what that was. Self-help of some kind, maybe business advice. I didn't know, I didn't need to know, not for my role. Despite the cue from the ceiling lights, Dr. Mark didn't instantly appear on the stage. In fact, he was running late. No one came out to explain his tardiness, giving everyone a well-lit stage and curtain to stare at, but nothing else. Once the delay started going on five minutes, the crowd's murmuring returned, heads looking around to other heads or to the rest of the auditorium in confusion. Delays weren't unheard of. Technical issues can and do occur, often at the worst times. But considering how out of the loop I was, it began to make me irrationally nervous. Did Dr. Mark figure out he was being videoed and had stopped to chew out my boss? Was he going to contact me and chew me out as well? So, when Dr. Mark finally walked out onto the stage, I nearly clapped with the ecstatic crowd, mostly out of relief. Dr. Mark strolled out with the ease of a man who'd done this a thousand times before waving his hand slowly and smiling like a politician at a bake sale fundraiser. I'd seen his picture before in the media. He was the doctor who was one of you, or so the tagline went. He wore nothing fancier than a black t-shirt and jeans, his hair a natural grey, his face dotted with a few moles and blemishes that he could have hidden behind pancake makeup. He was supposed to be approaching fifty, and he looked the part, but... For a moment, I swore that he seemed far older than that. A trick of the light, a bad video buffer for a moment, can't say for sure. The audience hadn't shared my moment, for they poured on the acclaim and cheer with gusto. Dr. Mark reached the centre of the stage and stood there, waving, saying thank you over and over, gulping down their attention as the crowd went to a standing ovation. My question over Dr. Mark's real age faded as the good doctor grew livelier, invigorated by the adoration. Welcome, true fans, to the last words you will ever need to hear, he said, and the audience cheered some more. That might have been music to their ears, but 
Oof, I winced at it. Just a little full of yourself there, eh, Dr. Mark? After the audience quieted again, Dr. Mark's smile faded to a neutral expression, and he seemed almost melancholy in that moment. You know, I don't think I'll ever get tired of being in front of you folks. You give me the energy I need to keep going. Just as I help you, you help me. It's what they call symbiosis. Oh, a wonderful word, symbiosis. It's too bad we can't talk about it more, because I have a lot to say, and not a lot of time to say it. Dr. Mark began strolling along the stage, dutifully casting his gaze around the auditorium as he continued to talk. I have obligations to meet tonight, folks. An obligation to you, and an obligation to me. Obligations all around, really. Those of you that I picked for this seminar, for this special moment, deserve to know the real truth. I will tell you why you're here, what's expected of you, and I shall give you a peace of mind before it's over. Tonight is the culmination of all our hard work, and I wouldn't be here without all of you. The audience clapped again, not as enthusiastically as before. Maybe they wanted Dr. Mark to get on with it, or maybe what he said had them a little confused. Only one camera was in use, and it was always focused on the stage. So I can only guess so much as to how Dr. Mark's words played with his audience. He certainly wasn't selling me on his brand of bullcrap, that's for sure. Ah, oh, but you're not here to listen to me ramble on about my duties and problems, right? He continued. You're here to get empowered. You're here because you undertook a journey years ago, a three-book odyssey to understand yourself and succeed in this messed-up world of ours. And I know you guys are authentic. Each and every one of you passed the test. You know what I need you to know. Oh, you're almost ready. But as the cooks say, you need to bake just a little longer. On cue, the curtain behind him parted, revealing an unremarkable blank wall. With the clicker in his left hand, he summoned a projected screen onto that wall. It was a PowerPoint slide showing the title of his first book, What You Need Is Inside You. There were a number of weird circle and line drawings peppering the empty space around the title, none of which bore any resemblance to any recognisable iconography in my mental library. I was aware that Dr. Mark used these drawings in all his books. He called them his success sigils, designed to bring good fortune to his readers. Out of curiosity, I looked up the word sigil before doing this job. Turns out, sigils are associated with magic and the supernatural. I dismissed it as another pointless gimmick from a modern-day snake or salesman. But whenever the camera focused on the slide directly, each time I would feel a sudden twinge of pain behind my eyes, as if the image was straining my vision. The pain intensified the longer I stared at the slide, and then diminished as either the camera or my eyes looked away. As much as it stung at times, I waved it away as some weird light or visual effect, something that gave sensitive people headaches when they stared at a computer monitor for too long. I hope that wasn't happening to me, since my livelihood depended on looking at video screens for long periods of time. Regardless, I quickly learned to avert my eyes when needed and powered through the rest of the show. My first book opened up your mind, Dr. Mark stated gesturing at the screen behind him. The words didn't matter so much, but the success sigils did. You read them along with all my thoughts about inner peace and special talents, and all that fortune cookie nonsense. You thought they were there to help you succeed, like a Buddha statue or rabbit foot. But when you read these sigils in the right order, over and over again, they do something amazing with your mind. They prepared you for the next step. Oh, can anyone tell me what that was? The audience, and I mean the entire audience, replied to him in one massive chorus. Get ready for further instructions. It was the title of his second book. 
when I say the audience replied, it was done with the utmost synchronicity. Five thousand voices managed to achieve the exact right tone with the exact right spacing and wording. It was both beautiful and frightening at the same time, because there was no way that five thousand people could have pulled off that level of precision without a hefty amount of practice. Hell, it didn't seem humanly possible to be that perfect. Beautiful, said Dr. Mark. Behind him, the screen switched to the title of his second book, and more sigils dotted the empty space around it. They were different than the last batch, and my eye strain was gone as well. I was relieved for a few blissful seconds, when the tuna fish sandwich I'd had for lunch wanted out of me all of a sudden. I grabbed the trash can next to my desk and barely managed to catch my puke before it all came flying out. After a few seconds of heaving, the nausea passed, and being the diligent worker I am, I placed the trash can to the side, wiped my mouth, and went back to watching and typing. It only took a few more seconds of exposure to that book title slide for my stomach to start feeling woozy once more, but when I wisely looked away, the nausea ended immediately. I knew that I could have paused the action and cleaned up my mess, since I was recording the stream on my laptop. But some part of me felt compelled to bear witness while it was still going on. I have to wonder now, looking back, if I was under a certain compulsion, probably a weaker version of what had enthralled Dr. Mark's audience. Because, near as I could tell, there was not a single moan complaint or display of gastronomical distress coming from the crowd. I felt like crap just looking at some title slides. They seemed to be having the time of their lives, a sea of happy, smiling faces waiting on Dr. Mark's every word. Oh, with my second book, you gained a new understanding on life, he declared. Again, not with my sterling prose but with all those sigils you viewed as you journeyed through my literature. I can't say that I understood it all myself, not at the time, but I began to realize that it's like a computer program. Anyone here a programmer? When no one raised their hand after a few seconds, Dr. Mark shrugged and went on. <laughs> not surprising. I never seem to attract the technical types. Well... Programs require a lot of time and work to get right. In this case, I was laying out a program for all of you, one sigil at a time. Building inside you a new way of thinking, a new way of life, preparing you for what comes next. Book title card number two went away behind him, and the next slide showed the title of his third book. We are almost there. At this point, I'd learned that maybe staring at the damn sigils was a bad idea. So I looked away initially, debating whether I could do the rest of this job on hearing alone. But either curiosity or compulsion got the better of me, and I snuck a quick glance. To my shock, book title card three was clear of sigils. Just the title of the book was displayed in a normal, boring font. Dr. Mark was now just standing there, his demeanour no longer enthused, replaced by a dire solemnity that made him age once again, to look far older than a man approaching fifty. That's when I heard the audience murmur for the first time since Dr. Mark had started his slideshow. Little pockets of confused statements arising from the crowd to fill the silence. Apparently this move surprised them as well, or perhaps the lack of sigils had released them from Dr. Mark's enthrallment. Then Dr. Mark slowly walked to the edge of the stage and sat down, dangling his feet over the edge and shaking his head slowly. He now reminded me of a father tasked with telling his kids that he'd been lying to them about the trip to Disneyland this whole time. I said you deserve the real truth, and I meant it, he began. I'm giving you all a moment of free will, so you can hear me clearly. Truth is, I didn't need to write a third book. I could have condensed all the sigils into my second book 
and sped this whole operation up a bit. But everyone likes trilogies, and I was making a lot of money. So the third book was just more of the same. It was me stretching out your programming longer so I could make another million. It wasn't my smartest move, I'll admit. A lot could have gone wrong, but what's life without some risk, right? And that's really the point I want to make to you all right now. Do you ever stop to think how many self-help books are out there? How many philosophies and religions are out on display, promising success in life if you just follow their careful instructions? And yet, very few of us are billionaires with glorious love lives and lots of fame and admiration. We want a surefire strategy, but there isn't one. It's just work and risk. I figured that out after enough years of doing things the hard way, and it was a bitter pill to swallow when I finally realized that even if I kept trying my best, my best wasn't likely to be good enough. Dr. Mark stood up and began backing away from the stage's edge, spreading his arms wide as if to encompass the whole of his congregation. That's when I learned of a second part. Sucking up to someone with all the goodies. If you can't get everything you want, be next to the one who can. All that it takes is paying the price. Your dignity, your morality, your soul even. The unhappy rumblings from the audience had gained traction. And no one thought to cheer or agree with Dr. Mark's rambling. The spell on the audience seemed utterly broken at this point. Where before they had been too enthralled or controlled to put it together, too hopeful or driven to see that their patron saint of success had hoodwinked them all. At that moment, I can't say I had any sympathy for them. The critics had been clear about Dr. Mark. The warnings had been obvious. P.T. Barnum knew a thing or two about human nature, but very few people listen to his words, because no one ever wants to admit that they have been, or could be, a sucker. But they didn't deserve what happened next. Neither did I. Dr. Mark had backed up all the way to the wall, directly under the projected video slides, and that solemn face of his quickly morphed back to his typical, energetic self. A big, toothy smile formed, and I felt goosebumps break out on my flesh upon seeing it. Symbiosis. Remember that word? Describes a cooperative relationship between two persons or two groups. For us, the idea was that I help solve your life problems, and you make me rich. Well, let's be honest. I doubt I solved your problems. But you did solve mine. And I am now about to solve a problem for my other symbiotic relationship. You see, they gave me a certain amount of power, as long as I eventually got them what they wanted. All my books, all my words, all my efforts culminate now in this final moment, and this final slide. He used his clicker and the slide changed to a barren white background graced with a single, solitary sigil dead center. This one had a familiar shape, that of a whirlpool circling counterclockwise. I couldn't tell if it was animated, or if the circular motion I saw was an optical illusion, and the center of the image seemed deeper, like a hole or tunnel that went through the wall itself. I wasn't at all sure where this was going, but despite the lack of discomfort, I decided I'd had enough and twisted my head away, intending to turn off the broadcast. Job be damned. I was done with this insanity. Except, my head didn't twist. My eyes couldn't shift. I tried my other body parts. Nothing. I couldn't type, stand up, or even blink. My eyes were fixed on my laptop, my body refusing to do anything but stare at that damn whirlpool sigil. I was alone in my apartment, 
but I still tried yelling, hoping a neighbour might hear. But my vocal cords were as paralysed as the rest of me. Despite my growing panic, I remained keenly aware of what was transpiring on the live stream. The audience had snapped back to attention, all enthralled once more, the auditorium growing eerily silent. The camera operator was seemingly in the same thrall as the audience, for the camera had tilted off a bit, revealing a small section of the audience in the forward seats. My eyes remained stuck on the screen, and I think I would have stayed that way for as long as the sigil was present, but now I had a better view of the crowd. At first, I thought the audience was equally paralysed, but I could see several people shaking in their seats like their chairs were equipped with vibration machines. As the seconds ticked by, more and more people followed suit, rattling their chairs and creating a humming sound that reminded me of a great engine slowly powering up. From my camera angle, I couldn't see any of their faces, couldn't read their expressions. In retrospect, I'm glad I couldn't. Dr. Mark's smile came and went sometimes replaced by a look of contemplation, sometimes by surprise. He paced up and down the stage several times, often out of view of the camera. I believe he was inspecting his audience, making sure everything was going according to plan. When he walked back into frame, he was practically jumping up and down with glee. <gasps> this is amazing, he said, yelling his words to his captive audience. I honestly didn't know what was going to happen. I mean, I knew that showing you these sigils would change you, rewire you in some new way, but I didn't think it would be so effective. I don't know if you have the capacity to hear me now, but I just want to say that again. Thanks for all your love and money over the years. Trust me, it won't all be for nothing. More and more people joined in on the vibrations until there was nothing but people in motion. I feared that any moment I might start vibrating as well, but so far I was merely stuck in place. Purely by accident, I was now the unwilling sole witness to Dr. Mark's closing act. It started with a man of Turkish descent, near the edge of my vision. His arms suddenly rose up and elongated his flesh stretching past any possible human limits, like he was a man of putty instead of flesh and bone. His arms arched over the audience as the bodies of others did the same. Hands and arms met each other in the air, entangled with one another, and then began to merge. The bodies left in the seats began to shrink as their mass spooled out through their limbs, their human forms losing shape and distorting. Something along the lines of a pillar of flesh formed at the joining point of all these bodies. There might have been more to it, but I couldn't see all of it, and I dearly wished I couldn't see what I already could. This went on for several ghastly minutes, as the audience slowly merged their flesh into this central mass, and I could see all manner of things flowing into the fleshy construct. Faces, fingers, Hair, organs, skin of all colours and textures, even bits of jewellery and clothing that had come along for the ride. Not a drop of blood to be seen, and that somehow made it worse. And the most maddening part of my exposure to Dr. Mark's machinations was that I began to feel an unnatural desire to be there. Couldn't be all that bad, right? All those other people... Joining together in one harmonious collective. No more pain, no more loneliness, no more responsibilities or decisions to make. Just go and be a part of it, and be happy in your new prison. Wouldn't that be better than what I have now? Through the horror, through my own conflict of blinding fear and unnatural yearning, I heard Dr. Mark speak. I couldn't see him now, but his microphone still relayed his last words loud and clear. Are you going to change the world? Are you one of my masters made flesh? Are you a door to let them through? I think 
after everything I have done for you, that it is time I got an answer. His answer came in the form of the ceiling caving in. I don't know how it happened, though I would imagine that the flesh thing in the middle of the auditorium had something to do with it. The air suddenly screamed with the echoes of bright lights and sound equipment crashing to the floor, smashing into the still merging audience, crushing flesh and sparking fires as hot lamps encountered flammable material. The flesh construct reacted badly to this, writhing away from the impact points, and the sound of more destruction erupted off-screen. I can't confirm it, but I swear I heard Dr. Mark himself scream out a denial as something huge collapsed near him. A moment later, the auditorium's projector cut out, and the sigil disappeared. My body immediately came back under my control, and then I lost it again as the strain of my ordeal overwhelmed me my body forcing a shutdown. Darkness quickly grabbed my mind and pulled me in, but I used my one brief moment of control to slam shut my laptop before I toppled off my chair into a long bout of unconsciousness. Well, you must have heard the official story by now. After all, it was one of the biggest tragedies in recent years, and equally one of the biggest mysteries. A convention center burns down and collapses, with 5,000 attendees, 12 staff members, and the famous Dr. Mark himself all trapped inside. And yet, not a single body recovered. Such a massive loss of life, but not a corpse to confirm it. The crime scene forensics people and insurance investigators still squabble over what happened to this day. You still might be thinking that I should have gone to the authorities told them my story, shown them the video file. Before you judge me on my silence, you should understand where things stand for me right now. Because when I woke up from my collapse, I hurt. Every joint in my body felt pulled and pinched. I'd sold myself and my head felt on fire. Pain relievers got me through the next few days and I healed up enough to get on with my life. But my health has never been the same. I can't look at a video screen for too long before getting a headache. And my last doctor's visit showed that my blood chemistry was all out of whack. If watching the video could do that to me, it could do the same to others, or worse. Hell, I'd probably die watching it again. The only reason I'm alive is because I never read Dr. Mark's books. So I wasn't programmed like the rest of his fans. I still believe that deleting the file was the right thing to do. But without any evidence, my story doesn't hold up. Besides, not only did they not find any bodies, they didn't find the flesh construct. Something that big, composed of 5,000 people, somehow being missed by all those investigators? <laughs> not possible. So for the longest of times, I thought one of two things had happened. That either I was crazy, and the contents of the live stream hadn't been real, or that the thing Dr. Mark created perished in the fire, and its body had disintegrated, like you see happen to some types of monsters in supernatural fiction. But I'm telling you all this because I know that there is a third possibility. That the thing Dr. Mark created escaped somehow. This thing that defies our laws of physics and biology may be out there, biding its time, waiting until Dr. Mark's legacy becomes a distant memory and we've all moved on. Because no matter what its true intentions for this world might be, it'll need to make more of itself. And so, it will eventually find another mouthpiece, another Dr. Mark to start selling people on a sure fire path to success. And that's when it'll tell you the last words you will ever need to hear. Ah, another brilliant story there for you on this Friday evening. Well, I've been doing a lot of work on my second channel, 
Have you all joined up? Have you? Go on, go over there and subscribe immediately because I'm doing more and more stories there as time goes by. Shorter ones, 5, 10, 15 minutes long, all brilliant. And not the kind of stuff that you want on this, my main channel, I guess. Well, if it is, then let me know because um, I'm trying to put longer and longer stories over here and leave the shorter ones for the uh, second channel. Okay, well, phew, tired after another long week, but of course I will be back again with you on Monday. And who knows, maybe I'll continue one of the serials on Sunday. Breach anyone? <laughs> yeah, I thought so. Okay, well, see you again very soon, but until then, sweet dreams and bye-bye. Thank you so much for choosing to spend your time listening to me. Now, if you enjoyed the Dr. Creepin experience, then come find me on Facebook. Come chat with me on Twitter. Listen to the background music and download it if you like on SoundCloud. Drop by the store, pick up a t-shirt. And, importantly, if you've got a story you'd like me to read, send it to Dr. Creepin's Vault, the subreddit I set up so that I could read your stories. Now, Looking forward to seeing you all again real soon, so come check me out, okay?